For those of you who don't know me, I'm Nicole Cusine. Nice to meet some of you. Nice to see familiar faces as well. Um, what I thought I would do is just do some basics. So this is gonna be sort of a 101. It might be a little basic for some people. It might be some new stuff for others. If there are, I'm gonna talk about just some basic stuff and some medical things. I think everybody in the room is old enough to hear the medical things. If they're boring or scary to you, we can talk about them after. I don't think they will be. Um, but just kind of a general sort of what does this mean? And then I hope we can talk later um, about some questions. You guys have issues that may be relevant to you as kids, as parents, and then kind of go from there. So I just sort of wanted to do a general overview first. So the first question that I get asked a lot is what are MPNs? Because these are things, again, that are not common in the world of pediatrics. So I like to think of them as a situation where you have too much stuff or too many things. So, and that can be a lot of different things. So it could be something called red blood cells, which are blood cells that are important for carrying oxygen around the body. They give you energy so you can do fun stuff. There might be too many white blood cells. White blood cells, they're really fun to look at under the microscope. I can show you pictures later if you want. Um, they're pink and purple, kind of cool. They do all sorts of different things in your body, but they're really important for helping fight against different infections and things like that. You might have too many of something called platelets. Platelets are really, really tiny under the microscope. They're really small. And what they do is sort of help prevent bleeding. So they're really important if you cut yourself. It's important to have platelets. Or it might be something called bone marrow fibrous tissue, which is really kind of, think of it as like string or like scar tissue. Like if you get a cut and then you get a little scar, that's kind of what it looks like, but on the inside. So what does bone marrow look like, right? So bones are hard. You know, you've eaten chicken. You've seen a chicken bone. You've possibly broken a bone if you're more adventurous than I am. Um, you know, on the outside, they're kind of hard. On the inside, they're sort of squishy and kind of look like a sponge. So, you know, this is obviously what a sponge looks like. Inside the hard part of your bone is this sort of dense, mushy stuff, which I like to think of like a sponge. And this is what it looks like under the microscope. You can see it from, you know, far away. There's you know, areas of bone and cartilage, and then there's these cells. So all the blood cells that are, you know, when your doctor checks your blood, all of those blood cells come from your bone marrow. So, you know, some of you who have MPNs may say, well, I don't know other kids with this. And, you know, people ask me how common is this, and it's pretty rare. So I would say for every 100 adults who get diagnosed, there's maybe one or two kids. So this is something that you may not have another kid in your school. There are definitely other kids out there, but you may not have met them yet, or you may not have gotten to speak to them before. And how do kids find out this happens? Well, there's usually two ways. One, it might just be like a routine blood test, like you go to a pediatrician, and some pediatricians check blood counts, and that's fine. And you feel fine, but you get a blood test, and something is funny about that blood test. Or you may not be feeling well, and your pediatrician may say, hey, I need to check some blood, and then they may find ultimately that you have an MPN. So that's usually sort of one of the two ways that it happens. What ages do this happen? So it can happen at any age. We see it more in teenagers, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen in younger kids. So I've personally taken care of children aged two to 21 with an MPN, so it's all different ages. There are some children who have familial forms of these that are born with it. So I know one young man who's 17 now who his mother had an MPN and he, you know, when he was born, they checked his platelets a few months later and they were already high. So he was diagnosed pretty much at a, you know, three months of age. But for the sort of more sporadic forms, we've seen kids as young as two. So what kind of symptoms might you have if you have an MPN? So it really varies from kid to kid. Um, it can be all different things. A lot of kids complain about headaches. That's a pretty common symptom that we see. A lot of kids have either nose bleeding or bleeding somewhere else or might get bruises somewhere. Some kids get chest pain or pains in other parts of their body. Some kids have a lot of stomach aches. Some kids can have what's called a big spleen. So your spleen is on the left side of your stomach under your ribs. It's an organ in your body that's important for helping clean the blood. Um, some kids get really itchy, especially after they do sports or after a hot shower. That might be a symptom they get. There are some kids who get funny pins and needles or weird feelings in their hands and feet. They might notice their hands or feet get kind of red or puffy. That's not uncommon. Some kids complain of leg pain, not necessarily in the joint, but just sort of in the bones or the muscle. Um, kids can get blood clots in different parts of their bodies. That happens to some children. And then some kids feel completely fine. 
and have no idea anything is wrong with their blood counts and have no symptoms. So it really varies from person to person. And if you line up 10 people with an MPN, they might all say they have different symptoms or feel differently. So what are some of the tests that you might get as a kid if your doctor's trying to work you up? So of course you're gonna get blood counts, right? Because we're talking about blood stuff. They'll check your liver and your kidney function to make sure all the important organs are working properly. They'll check something called an erythropoietin level. This is kind of important to do. Erythropoietin is a hormone, which is like a protein in your body. And that is something that really helps drive your body to make red blood cells. So that is one of the main ways your body knows to make red blood cells. So often in kids with polycythemia, which is a type of MPN, we see that erythropoietin gets elevated. So, it get, I'm sorry, it gets decreased. So that is something that we'll often check in a kid when we're working them up for an MPN. Even if we're not sure if they have polycythemia, even if they just have high platelets, that's something we'll, we'll usually check. Um, we'll look at inflammatory markers. So. Unlike adults, kids, it's very, very common to get high platelets because of something going on in your body. A cold, um, some kind of underlying problem. So we'll usually check for something inflammatory to see if that is going on. We'll also do some specific testing. There's certain tests that if you have high red blood cells, we're gonna look into to see if that's a cause of the high red blood cells. Same thing for platelets. So depending on which of your blood counts look a little off, that might drive some of the tests we do. And then, you know, depending on you, we'll do different things. You know, if your stomach hurts or you feel like you have a big spleen, we might get an ultrasound to look at everything. So it really just depends on, on you what additional things we'll do. So one question that comes up for parents and kids a lot is do I need a bone marrow test? So my answer is yes. So a bone marrow test, I don't know, has, who's here has had a bone marrow test? I know some of you have, right? Okay. Um, so a bone marrow test sounds terrible. It's not that bad. Um, but it is really important because what it'll do, it'll give us some information on one, what do the cells in the bone marrow look like? Remember, these are the cells. This is the place where all these cells come from. So if there's too many of them, I need to know why. So looking in the bone marrow is really important. You can look for early cells called blasts. You can look at that stringy stuff that I showed you, that sort of bone marrow fibrous tissue. So even though some people say, ooh, I don't know how I feel about a procedure, it's a very benign procedure in you know, the list of procedures that we can do to you, and it's really important. So I usually encourage everyone, if they haven't had a bone marrow, to get one. What about genetic testing? So is your doctor gonna recommend genetic testing? Yes. So, so just a little bio 101 for the kids who have not gone to high school yet. So genes, right? So you probably have heard of genes. So genes are the parts of your body that carry around your stuff called DNA. And DNA tells your body how tall to be and what color your hair should be and what color your eyes should be. And if you're gonna you know, be clumsy or good at sports, it tells you a lot of different things about how to be and grow. And so there are certain genes that are related to making blood cells. So we're gonna do genetic testing on people when they're being worked up for an MPN because it'll give us a lot of useful information. So the three main genes that we know over the years now that are important for MPNs are JAK2, MIPL, or MPL, they have goofy names, I know, and CalR. So these are the three most common genes that we test in kids with MPNs. So we will definitely send those off, and obviously if one is positive, we don't need to check the rest. If one is negative, then we'll do the rest. Some places you go will do what's called secondary gene panels, so there's a lot of work that's been done in adults looking at other genes that might be mutated where they might say, hey, you know, we know you have this main mutation, but now you have an extra gene mutation or something about that gene in the letters that's unusual that may be important for your MPN. So we're gonna you know, make a recommendation based on that. So there's a lot of um, different genes that can be tested. And we also, on the bone marrow specifically, usually do something called cytogenetics, which looks at your chromosomes. So most males are 46XY and most females are 46XX. You can have, you know, you have 23 pairs of chromosomes. You can have an extra piece, a missing piece. So that'll give us useful information also that will kind of help us predict some of the things that might happen. So we're gonna do all these tests on you. So what does this mean? So people ask me, what does this mean if my kid has this? So the way I think of MPNs in kids is I think of them as chronic bone marrow disorders. So you can have acute medical problems like when you get the flu where you're, there's some kind of you know, problem going on in your body, it's short lived and then it goes away and then you don't have the flu forever. These are chronic things, so you live with them, but they're things that you know, you have day to day and you grow with them and you develop normally with them and you go to school with them. 
you know, you can do all your normal activities unless you're a kid who happens to have a bleeding problem. And then we might say, we don't want you playing contact sports. I don't need you getting hit in the head, you know, playing lacrosse. I see you looking over there, buddy. But, you know, other than that, there's no reason you can't go to school, do fun things, you know, be a kid. That's your job. Um, and one thing that comes up, and this is a scary word that you may see if you use the internet, but the word cancer. Some people and adults worry about, you know, getting cancer. I don't worry about that in kids. So this is one of the biggest questions parents often have is, is this chronic problem going to become acute leukemia? So acute leukemia is something that adults get, that kids get, um, and rare in, you know, all different times. But kids with MPNs, we don't think get leukemia the same way adults do. So this is just an example. So I took 20 of the patients who enrolled in my clinical research study. And we looked at what's called person years. So you take all the time that each kid has had exposed to an illness, which means from the time you're diagnosed to the time now, basically. You know, obviously there are kids who are probably diagnosed before, you know, who probably had the disease before they were diagnosed. So we're probably missing some of those years of exposure. But realistically, from the time these kids were diagnosed to now, if you add it all up, we have 85 person years of, of exposure to having an MPN, and none of these kids have had transformation to MDS or AML. I know one girl who was diagnosed when she was three, she's 18 now, perfectly fine. I know one young man who was diagnosed when he's 13, he's 25 now, I think, 26, perfectly fine. So while this is a real concern for older adults, we don't see this in kids. The literature that is out there in kids is limited, but you know all the retrospective studies in young people, this is not happening to kids. So this is not something I worry about when I see an eight-year-old patient or when I see an 11-year-old patient. I'm not concerned about them getting AML in their childhood. So the question then comes up as treatment. So what do we do? So one thing I will say is that perfectly healthy kids who feel 100% fine and other than their high count have perfectly normal labs don't necessarily need to be treated. So if you had this randomly picked up, you have no symptoms, you're a star athlete, your bleeding tests come out normal, your platelet count is 800,000, you may do nothing, and that's okay. It's, you know, when you have symptoms or when you find that you have an acquired von Willebrand disease and you're at risk of bleeding, that's when we start to talk about treatment. So the medical treatments that we use in kids right now are aspirin, hydroxyurea, and interferon. People ask about newer agents like ruxolitinib and other things. Those are not yet fully tested or approved for kids with MPNs, and this includes ruxolitinib and sort of the JAK inhibitors you hear about. So those are things that are still being studied at sort of earlier stages, and we can talk more about that. What about non-medical treatments? So phlebotomy is a common one that you may have heard about. So phlebotomy is, it kind of sounds crazy, but it's where you draw a lot of blood off somebody. So you know how when you get your blood drawn, you get a couple of little tubes of blood, not a big deal? point of phlebotomy is to take off a lot more blood because those are for kids or adults who have too many red blood cells. So if you really have too many red blood cells, doing phlebotomy and drawing off the extra blood is a good way to get rid of blood cells, decrease cytokine levels, things like that. So that is certainly an option for someone who has high red blood cells. And then there's a lot of studies in adults being done looking at complementary things like nutrition, like yoga, things like that. Those are questions that I hope we can look at in kids, but you know, I can't tell you that doing yoga will make you feel better. It makes me feel better. I think it makes, in general, everyone feel good. But we don't have evidence yet in kids what complementary type things would be beneficial. So let's talk about the two main medicines we use in kids and which is right for your child. So hydroxyurea, this is a medicine that we have been using for many years in pediatrics. If you've talked to your doctor about it, it's something that is frequently used for a disease called sickle cell disease. Sickle cell disease is totally different than MPNs, so not a direct comparison, but it's just an example of saying, we've used this for years and years in children and we know they tolerate it well. It's an oral medicine, so you know if you can take a pill or drink a liquid, you can take hydroxyurea. The side effects are pretty minimal. More common things are abdominal stuff. So some kids will take hydroxyurea and get a stomach ache. They'll need to take it with food. Some kids find it gives them headaches, but most kids who take hydroxyurea, and I've put hundreds of kids on it, are generally fine. People always say, you know, because it's a chemotherapy, will my hair fall out? I've only seen that in two children in my entire career so far on hydroxyurea. So while when you mix hydroxyurea with lots of other chemos for different types of cancer, sure, your hair might fall out. But for most children who take hydroxyurea, that's not an issue. So the negatives of hydroxyurea, so people ask, you know, can it affect your ability to have children someday? It is a chemotherapy, so the answer is absolutely, possibly. 
Are there thousands of people who have taken hydroxyurea and go on to have many adorable, delicious children? Yes, absolutely. So it's not going to cause infertility. It might cause problems. So it's always something to think about when you start hydroxyurea. Just know that it's a medicine that in the gamut of things it can do, effects on fertility are possible. The other question that comes up with hydroxyurea, and you'll hear some people talk about you know, their use of hydroxyurea today, is will hydroxyurea give you leukemia? So my answer for children is no. So if you look in the literature, there's a lot of mixed data. There's some studies in adult patients that say the risk of leukemia is higher in people taking hydroxyurea. There's some people who say it isn't higher. There's some people who say it's only higher when you mix it with other chemotherapy drugs. So there's no clear evidence that this happens, that, that this definitively in all patients will definitely increase your risk. And there's certainly not an increased risk in kids that we've seen. So, you know, if you ask an adult practitioner, they might say, well, I use it for my older patients. I don't use it for my 30 and 40 year olds because of this potential risk. And that's fine. But we've used it in many children and we don't believe it increases their risk of leukemia. So if that is something that is concerning to you, I don't think of that as something that would prevent me from starting a child on hydroxyurea. The other medicine that we use in kids is interferon. So interferon is something that's been used for many years in MPNs. It's something that is used less frequently in children, but I think over the next five years that may change. So there are patients who take interferon who go into what's called a remission where their blood numbers look normal, their percent of abnormal protein, let's say they have a JAK mutation, goes away. So unlike hydroxyurea, interferon has a much clearer effect on sort of lowering the abnormal protein. Hydroxyurea does that for some people, not everybody. The negatives of interferon, so some of the side effects are brutal. Um, I think years ago we had much of a harder time with interferon because of the older formulations. A lot of people had to stop using it because they just felt so miserable and it was really debilitating. I think nowadays we have the new pegylated long-acting forms. I think those are becoming much more tolerable and we're seeing people use them more and more. So I think if you, know, if you get through the first couple of weeks and you don't feel miserable, then you might be fine. Um, it is an injection. Some people are just completely needle phobic and faint every time they get their blood drawn and can't stand the thought of putting a needle in their body. I saw that face you made. So, you know, it's, it's not a huge needle, but it's a needle. So for some people, that's just an absolute not gonna touch me. For other people, it doesn't matter, and that's great. And then the only other real concerns that I think about with interferon is there is some evidence and experience with people taking interferon and having an underlying illness unmasked. So if you have a very strong family history of autoimmune things like lupus in a lot of family members or severe psychologic illness in a lot of family members, that may be someone who is less inclined to take interferon because you're afraid if you're prone to getting lupus or if you have lupus that hasn't declared itself yet and you take this, maybe you'll then you know, show signs of lupus. So those, when I think about those two drugs, those are sort of the main pros and cons I think about. Honestly, there are kids being treated with both who are doing well. So I think the most important thing to me is that you really talk to your physician about options. You see what fits for you. And if you try one and it doesn't work, you can switch. If you try one and it works for you, that's great. There are some people who become sort of refractory to hydroxyurea. It may stop working. Again, I know people who have been on it for 14 years and have had excellent symptom and count control and have had no problems. So it really just depends on you and everybody's a little different. So, you know, you try it, you see what works for you and you make adjustments. You know, the question comes up about ruxolitinib, which is really the main other therapy that exists for adults. That's sort of, you know, beyond the clinical studies where we know it helps. So it's not really approved for use in kids under 18. So there are some clinical trials being done. Um, the Children's Oncology Group has done some early studies with ruxolitinib, but that was more for kids with refractory disease or leukemias. So there hasn't been a ton of study yet in kids with MPNs. So I think it's something that you would think about on a case-by-case -case basis, and hopefully in the future we'll have more studies using this medicine. It's also something we're not currently using up front for ET, so it would really be more for kids with polycythemia or fibrosis. So, where are we headed? So we're really trying to learn more about these diseases so we can do a better job of diagnosing them, counseling you guys, and figuring out what to do. So I like to think of it as, as the iceberg. So, so if this is the world of PEDS MPN, I kind of feel like we're up here, and I think our goal is to get down here and really break through a lot of the questions that people have, and we're working on it. 
So, so one thing, for example, is, you know, if you've ever Googled the diagnostic criteria for these diseases, they're really based on adults, right? So one thing that, that our group thought is we looked at a bunch of kids, oh, sorry, with, um, oh, you know what, is this a pointer? Am I that untechnologically savvy? That is absolutely possible, but this could be a pointer. Oh, look at that, look at, you know, yeah, look at that, hot, okay. Only two thirds of the way done and found this. So. So one thing I will say is that if you look at the criteria, for example, for PV, it says a hemoglobin over 16 in women or 16 and a half in men. Well, if you, so remember, kids are not little adults. So if you take one of our PEDS handbooks and look up sort of the normal reference ranges for younger kids, there may be a six-year-old who has a hemoglobin of 15, which is high for a six-year-old, but is not high enough to meet these criteria but maybe that kid actually has PV and we're missing it. So one thing we need to really start thinking about is putting these criteria into context for kids because you guys are different than adults, right? So maybe just saying what's you know, outside the normal range for your age and gender. Maybe that's more important for you, you know, than what the adult cutoffs are. You know, and we know that kids tend to have f lower rates of those common mutations that we looked at in those genes than adults. So maybe, you know, unlike adults where reactive thrombocytosis or seeing high platelets because something is going on in your body is not common, in kids we see that all the time. I remember I went to a meeting with some adult people who are very smart and very good at adult medicine and they pulled out this case report of an adult, like a 45 year old guy who had a, some random virus and his platelet count went up to 900,000 or a million and they were super excited and fascinated by this. And I'm like, I get the, consulted for that literally once a week when I'm on you know, the inpatient service and peds because every time a kid gets the flu, their platelets shoot up. Every time they get RSV or a common kid virus, their platelets shoot up. So things that are important in adults may be different than what's important in kids. So in adults, it's really important to have these gene mutations. In kids, I think it's equally important to not have some underlying inflammatory condition because we see that all the time. So really trying to reframe maybe the diagnostic criteria for kids in a different way than we would think about adults. And what we're really trying to do is sort of bridge the gap, and I didn't make this, I found this cute little thing somewhere, but I stole it and that's fine. Um, really trying to you know, bridge the gap between what we know and what we're able to do for you guys as kids and families. So you know, one thing we're looking at again in kids is diagnostic criteria and being able to properly figure out which kind of MPN kids have. We're creating a clinical database where we can really learn over time how kids with MPNs do compared to adults. We're in the process of developing assessment tools, so symptom assessment and effects on quality of life is stuff that's been heavily studied in adults and has really been very helpful to guide discussions on when to treat and things like that. So we're in the process of developing those surveys um, and interviews for families and kids now. So you may get an email from me saying, I want to talk to you about doing an interview or a survey. Um, and then in the lab side, what we're doing is we're trying to get a better understanding of the genes that cause these diseases in kids. So, you know, some kids, again, have one of those three common things, some kids don't. So can we figure out what's causing stuff in those kids? Can we look at cytokines in kids? Because we know this has been looked at in adults, and cytokines are proteins in your body that cause inflammation. So that can lead to a lot of the symptoms you might have. So can we look at that in kids? Can we look at different protein profiles that are being expressed that might explain why some kids have different symptoms than others, why some kids seem to feel better than others? So we're trying to look at all these things, and really our goals are to better understand these diseases so we can better counsel you guys and your parents, and then we can give you more treatment options and really say, well, you know, these are the list of things we can do, what works for you? You know, and I, I would love to talk to some of you later about sort of what issues are important to you. You know, I think my view as the pediatrician it's probably very different than your view as the kid or your view as the parent. So, you know, I think our goals should align and I hope that they do, but if there are things that are of importance or meaning or value to you that I'm not thinking about, I want you to tell me because I feel like you guys are the ones who should be helping drive this research. Um, and again, these are rare diseases, especially in kids, but I really think if we all work together and I think there are people getting more interested in this, um, Dr. Rezer, who you'll hear from later, um, and I have been collaborating. I've been reaching out to people across the country. We're working on projects looking at interferon in children with different institutions. And I really think if we work together, we can really kind of get to this spot because I think we're sort of stuck up here and we're drifting down and I think we're ultimately gonna get here and it's gonna take time and it's gonna take people, but we're getting there. So I think we will get past that tip of the iceberg together.